I'm Ed Blankenship. I'm a product manager for um, Team Foundation Service and uh, Developer Tool Services, um, straight from uh, Redmond. And uh, I love I love this service. Uh, we've been I've been with TFS for a very very long time. Um, I've been with TFS since probably yeah the beginning um, in 2005 2004. And uh, I've been an administrator. I've had to go through tons and tons of uh, installs and upgrades and managing it over time. Um, I was a release engineering manager for three years at Infragistics um, and uh, helped us through our transformation to, uh, to TFS. And you might have heard a few uh, experiences of mine um, in managing TFS, and some of that has to do with disaster recovery. And you know, we had a really bad dis disaster actually one time. Um, I I still have it on my calendar as the great TFS disaster of 2008. It's a yearly reminder for me uh, to remember about that disaster recovery. Uh, there's there's a lot. So I've I've gone through a lot of administration work. And uh, when, we, when we started working on the service, I was really, really happy because um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to administer TFS um, in the right way. I mean, you can certainly just go next, 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 but there's some other thinking to do. And a lot of people don't um, consider their dev, their dev tools environment you know, as something mission critical for their organization. But um, as we learned at, at Infragistics, it is absolutely a mission critical system. So uh, um, some businesses are all, all run around that, and so it's as important as Exchange or um, you know SAP or any any of those other mission critical systems. By the way, here's um, if you want to get in touch with me afterwards. Uh, there's my email address. There's a Twitter handle, my blog Ed Squared, um, and then I'm also a lead author for a couple of books, including um, two about TFS. So uh, feel free to grab that one. Um, we put, there's four of us, including you may know Grant Holiday um, in Canberra. So he's on our, he's now moved back over to the TFS team. He's, uh, we have a worldwide 24 hour um, operations team that monitors Team Foundation Service. So uh, Grant is our, is our guy uh, in this time zone. So um, Grant does a lot of work around maintaining and keeping the Team Foundation service up. We have amazing availability. Um, we're technically still in preview, although you can use it in production. Um, but we've got amazing availability. You can use it in production. Um, we, we use it for several of our internal um, development as well. So now we've, we've moved in our industry to a couple of um, different trends. So we're starting to see um, lots of different kinds of devices. They're not just Windows PCs and tablets um, or Windows devices. You've got everything. You've got uh, mobile devices. You've got Android devices. Um, you've got our friends at Apple. Um, you have a lot of also hybrid IT, which is you know being able to scale out um, uh, with your data centers and extending that into the cloud um, as one big data center. So we're having a lot of that. Another thing, um, especially here in Australia, you could appreciate this, a lot of teams are becoming more and more distributed across the world. Um, and uh, so when we think about our ALM tooling, we want to make sure that we have something that's available for those distributed teams as well. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of teams um, not necessarily move into continuous delivery, but move into more frequent delivery. Uh, a really good example of that is ours. Um, we used to be on a two, three year release cycle. Um, and now the Team Foundation Service team specifically actually releases um, every three weeks. And so uh, whether the feature is done or not, now that's a different discussion. Um, <laughs> but it goes to production every three weeks. So uh, we have a, a very interesting feature flag system um, so that uh, any unfinished work doesn't get exposed to anyone um, that the normal accounts out there. But technically, you know, if I put in a code change in today, it would be in uh, the service in about three weeks. So the first test case is 
is there a feature flag and is it turned off? <laughs> so, uh, so we've learned we've learned this. Um, amazingly, this this um, moving to more frequent delivery, we've actually noticed a lot of um, cultural and behavioral changes inside of our team. Um, you used to have these like huge milestones um, that we'd be reaching up to, and and uh, if I were to show you a chart of our bugs in the let's say the 2008 release. Um, you could see them going all the way up to every single milestone, whether you know beta or RC, et cetera. Um, and w we were really promoting a bad habit, which was you know get everything in before that that deadline, and then we'll fix the bugs later. That's a horrible way of doing it. Um, so in the past, you know our our uh, milestones were not as great. Um, but that's completely changed with our frequent release cycle because now, you know, as a dev, I know that it's going to go into production in a couple of days. Um, or, you know, even if I'm working on Visual Studio, we actually push out um, those updates. Uh, we release them quarterly, but we actually push those out every three weeks as well. Our whole entire division's on the same sprint schedule. Um, so, y as a dev, you kind of know that it's going to be out there a little bit um, quicker. So you kind of look at the problem a little bit differently. Um, and then the other nice thing is that we, we introduce small enough changes where if there is something wrong, um, the dev is only slept maybe a couple of times instead of you know, a, year, you know, a year worth of nights of sleep. So you're able to kind of remember, oh yeah, that's what I did. Yes, sir? No, oh, well, so that's actually, t that's a really good question. So. Um, the question was, with all these frequent um, releases, are we repeating a lot of testing? Well, we've had to change that as well. So um, we've had to completely transform. And, and actually, um, I do a different talk about learning from us and our engineering of the service. But um, we learned very early on that we needed to be very efficient with our testing. So we, we took, well, there was a lot of technical debt around test automation that we had. And now we've got it, and um, so especially when you start to think about installing and upgrade, there's a lot of debt there that we hadn't ha um, taken care of. But yes, we've we've now got uh, several rolling suites of builds that do s different priority levels of tests, but they're pretty much all automated. We do exploratory to tours every once in a while as well. We also um, we will upgrade our server as well uh, with every new sprint build. And then the the larger dev dev server, which has you know tons and tons of people on it, um, it gets upgraded very frequently as well. So we um, we get a l we hit it quite a bit. <laughs> and the other interesting thing is we also um, changed it to where our devs actually own production now as well. So in tandem with ops, but if there's a problem in d in production, the devs own it as well. And that changes kind of you know some of the behaviors that we've had. So we actually um, we will see bugs probably before you guys do. We have really interesting set of um, me metrics and analytics, and um, our VP loves it. Brian Harry, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, he is he's a metrics guy, and he is seeing all sorts of patterns um, all the time. And we will find bugs in those patterns. Um, and he will he will find them. I mean, it's it's amazing uh, the kind of the kind of work that we've done around this. So we've had to change. We've had to change. So um, all right. So what we've what we've done is um, we've really built the Team Foundation Server is really the core of our ALM family of tools. Um, and so if you haven't ever seen this, this is a cycle that typical teams will go through, you know, they'll define with requirements and put them on their product backlog. Um, they'll implement their software by, you know, doing the traditional development activities um, and development and testing. Then you uh, release it out to production, um, put it on the ops backlog, um, and then you'll actually learn from what's happening in production and then put that back on your backlog as well. So this is the continuous um, delivery cycle. Hey, Adam. <laughs> so I gave Adam, I was heckling Adam in, in the first session, so I, I'm anticipating some today. Um, funny story. Uh, so these guys, I don't, uh, 
I won't bore you with my history of Australia, but this is my first time in Australia. This is not my first airplane ticket to Australia, though. Um, <laughs> I've had four. Uh, but <laughs> they had me go in with this drop bear thing for a long time. Um, and I'm sitting, uh, so this weekend I was with a couple of mates in Sydney, and uh, we went out to the bush, and I still get freaked out, you know, going through and hearing a rustling. But, um, yeah, so... <laughs> All right, um, here's some other concepts that we uh, end up uh, putting through. We want, we want to, you know, there was a talk yesterday at the keynote. Um, he was explaining that we want to make failure really cheap um, so that you can do more of it. I mean, we don't want to fail all the time, but um, the point was to be able to try out things. Um, and so we've done that as well with the service. Now, TFS actually enables um, ALM. And uh, we've got we've got different pieces in, in across all of our different um, um, activities here. So, agile planning for the stakeholders, um, backlog management, capacity planning. Uh, there's certainly lots of developer productivity enhancements. Um, you can also request feedback from your stakeholders, and they can provide feedback with a rich tool um, that you don't have to pay for. By the way. Uh, and then we have automated builds and um, testing and continuous delivery if you're using Azure. Um, and we have very strong integration with um, Microsoft on-premises offerings as well. So Now, I'm going to move forward here. So that brings us to the Team Foundation service. Um, we are hosting Team Foundation server for you. It is, um, we work out of the same exact branch uh, so the Team Foundation server that you get every quarter um, is the Team Foundation service, but we're, we're actually ahead on the Team Foundation service. We will deliver features first there, um, and then we'll roll those up into a quarterly update, or like in, in um, some of the cases for features, we've actually packaged them up for TFS 2013, uh, which should be, which is available now for, uh, if you want to go live into production, you can certainly do that as well. Um, but I love having the service. Um, my previous position was um, the engineering product owner for lab management, and I used to have to carry this huge laptop around. Um, and lab management's one of those things where if I wanted to take new builds of lab management, I had to actually like pave my machine every time and because it's Hyper-V based and, oh man. <laughs> so then I moved over to being product manager for Team Foundation Service, which is great because now I just have a browser. I could wipe that machine anytime I want. It's, it's just always there. Um, and as a former administrator, I don't have to worry about anything. We got poor folks like uh, Grant in Canberra having to worry about administering the <laughs> server for me. But I'd much rather have Grant do it than anyone else. So, uh, so And we're taking care of things. We're taking care of you know, monitoring it, tw keeping it up 24-7. Um, you know, disaster recovery, we do all the backups for you as well. Um, so uh, scalability, you know, one of the, th one of the things that I, I found sad um, over the years as, as a former Microsoft MVP and ALM consultant is I would hear people dog on TFS all the time. It's like slow, you know, um, and a lot of times when I went to go look at it, it's actually the way it was configured and the hardware that it was sitting on internally. And so I was, I was really sad by that because TFS gets a bad impression whenever it's not being run well. So. We take care of that as well. It's very highly available. We keep, we watch the performance. We will scale out all of the servers that are necessary. We, it sits on Azure, by the way. Um, we built it on Azure, but you don't have to understand that. Um, so we can scale out however much we need to. Now, we've got everything in here. I mentioned a couple of things in here um, that you need. We've got the Scrum, Agile, and CMMI process template. Um, you can also take any IDE you want to, you can bring your own IDE. I mentioned yesterday you could use Eclipse and uh, Xcode and certainly Visual Studio as well and you can connect on up to the Team Foundation service. Um, and we support any kind of source code, any source code whatsoever. Um, you can just pop it in there and we're good to go. The other interesting thing is we have um, two kinds of uh, source control repositories. We have a uh, traditional version control, which is um, what you've always been used to with TFS. We also have distributed version control using Git repos. And 
the way we've implemented Git is exactly the way it is. I mean, there's no differences. Um, if you were to, we only announced that earlier this year, I think. Oh wait, yeah. Was it this year? Yeah. Okay. Time goes by, um, and sometimes I don't remember what we've announced and what we have, <laughs> which is bad for the product manager, I guess. Um, <laughs> you, guys, you guys may hear something that we haven't announced yet, and there you go. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things is um, before this announcement, if you were crafty enough uh, and took a look at the GitLib, GitLib project, um, which is essentially the, the, the base APIs for um, interacting with Git, um, there's two large contributors that work on that. That's GitHub and Microsoft. And so you would have seen all those commits from our Microsoft employees. So <laughs> we continue to work. We work um, very closely with GitHub on that work. Um, and so, you know, the guys are, are good uh, good colleagues across the across the way. So we have a shared mutual interest in making sure that Git is a first class citizen. Now, one thing that we have done differently with our Git, Git implementation is that um, we've made it enterprise grade. So um, from the back end, you can trust that we've, um, you know, we've thought about all the things that enterprises would care about. So think about security and permissions. Um, you think about how it's stored. We store it in SQL Server. So um, we, we get much, much better um, uh, disaster recovery and those kinds of concerns around that as well. So um, we've, we've truly, yes? Yeah, so we're thinking about it. <laughs> I don't have anything additional to share, but I can get you in touch with Martin Woodward, who's um, thinking about that. So yeah, we know, we know SSH is one of those things. It's tricky to, to get done, especially when we start thinking about Ash, um, Windows, or sorry, Active Directory and stuff, so. Okay, so um, which traditionally with services, you know, we don't want people to actually even think about it, right? It's just there. Um, so it sounds like um, not a particularly a disaster with the whole entire service with all the customers, but you're wondering, hey, if I've made specific changes in my server that I just want to roll back a day. You can actually do that today. Um, you, you can um, contact our support group. Um, there's there's a contact on our on our page, and actually Grant Holiday would probably be the one who would help you. But yeah, we can do that, and we do that in in individual scenarios. But it, in general, it's not something you just want to think about. So um, if you're looking for more information, we could certainly provide that. But we hope that you just don't have to think about it, and that's that's what our goal is. So, but we certainly can. You can always, if there's something that um, you don't know how to do, just ask the. Uh, the TFS service guys, the service delivery guys, and they'll help you out. Some things we can do, some things we can't. You can do all sorts of stuff, Jerry rig on the back, so. <laughs> um, but as I say that, we actually don't have access to your code. I don't, I keep hearing this quite a bit. Um, there's, a, there's an impression, you know, SkyDrive has been great for companies. Um, SharePoint Online has been great for companies. No one thinks twice about putting that kind of intellectual property um, up in the cloud service. But when we start thinking about Team Foundation Service, it's a different conversation. And I'm actually not sure why that is. Um, but I do want to establish that um, employees do not have access to code. Uh, we keep that s very strictly guarded. Um, there is a mechanism that if you ask us to do something, we can do that for you. But other than that, I mean, Brian Harry can't even get to your code. So um, there, we have tight, tight um, um, uh, controls around that. And uh, we're actually going through the process of, of making sure we're compliant around that as well. So you can see uh, our ISO um, compliance with that. So we're going through that process right now. Uh, but we do have them in place. So just in case anyone um, is, is concerned about that. Now let's go actually um, look at what, what the service is. So uh, let's 
this up here and then all right sweet all right cool all right so if you haven't ever been here this is tfs.visualstudio.com um, it is how you actually create your tfs account um, in the background so you can see up here sign up for free we'll go up here you can uh, grab whatever name you want. Um, you can use this for uh, work. So if you want to create a tenant account for your workplace, um, feel free to do that. You can also, I'd suggest everyone having their own um, as well. So, you know, I have one, Ed B, that I use on um, my different projects and everything that I do as well. So it is designed to have, you know, multiple tenant accounts and then we take care of that in the background for you. So once you do that, um, we don't ask you for a credit card. We only ask you for a name. You sign in with your Microsoft account. You're ready to go. So um, um, you're just ready to go. We already have these databases actually created, and then we just assign one to you. So that's it's. there's not much waiting there. Um, other than that, some of the other things you might want to find out is you can come over here to learn. Learn is a great area for just being able to do the basic tasks. Um, it's interesting, uh, the engineering team now owns this particular part of the, the site, um, and uh, I find it to be some of the best documentation I've ever seen. Um, and and it's, very, it's very task oriented, so you know, getting started, you know, Visual Studio with, with Get or Xcode, you can see all the different things you wanna do, and we actually go through step by step how to do it with screenshots and everything. So it's really great stuff. If you've got a team member that is you know, doing mobile development or some other kind of development, you can just point them over to this. You can learn new things. So you know, we'll talk about build in a second, testing, collaborating. There's lots of great ways of, of going and do this. But most people don't actually know that this is there. And I wanted to make sure I pointed that out for you guys. Any questions? Feel free to, by the way, anytime you have any questions, I will gladly take them. Okay, so once we have that, um, we can actually go in. Uh, I'll show you kind of what that looks like um, when it's empty. So I will, uh, let's bump that up a little bit. There we go. So you get two options there. Um, you wanna start a new team project, and a team project has multiple teams in it, so you know, think large. Um, additionally, a team project can have multiple Git repositories in it as well. So you can have as many Git repositories as you want, um, and you can manage those individually. So, and I would suggest that you do that. That's one big difference between Git and um, traditional version control is, you know, in, in regular TFS version control, you can kind of map your workspace to only what you want. Well, with Git, you're cloning the entire repo. So uh, you're getting everything. So you want to think, you know, isolate those into modular pieces. So. I'm a fan of that approach. I mean, everyone has a different opinion on that one. So, but it's different because you can't map, <laughs> can't uh, cloak, and stuff. So you just get started there. Um, I pick a name for it. Um, it'll be around for a while, so uh, make sure you pick, you know, the right one. And I just checked on user voice again, and that's probably the number one one still. Again, we are looking at that. It's a really hard problem, actually. Got to love legacy code. Um, so then you pick which process template. I would suggest if you're doing Scrum, pick the Scrum one. Um, it's good to go there. And so then we'll go and create that for you, and, and uh, that'll be available to you probably within a couple of minutes. Um, and then once you're there, you've got a team set up, and you can go in and add your team members over here on the side. Can uh, configure your schedule and iterations. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the Agile planning tools that we have available because uh, Richard Banks is going to do a great session on Friday about specifically Scrum and Kanban with uh, Team Foundation Service. So feel free to go to his session. Uh, we've got different, you can have the concept of team favorites. So, hey, this branch is my favorite or this, um, these workout inquiries like, you know, number of bugs and those kinds of things. Those get added, uh, you can add those on your main page here. And then you can also have favorite builds as well. So, and you can, you can reorganize these however you want to. And every team can have their own visualizations on the front page as well. So, how many folks are actually 
using the Team Foundation service today. Yeah? Great. Um, for the other folks, are you using Team Foundation server? <coughs> yeah? Good, good. Okay. So a lot of this, um, by the way, it'll just start flowing in a Team Foundation server. So a lot of these concepts are, are the same. And I'll point out the differences in a second between the server and the service. The other thing um, that, we, that Adam mentioned this morning um, is that, oh, gotta love that. So this service, this server account um, is Martin Woodard's and it's set on Pacific time in, in the US and so we're in a new day here. It's just, it's odd being over here. I have learned a lot, by the way, coming over here. <laughs> um, and it takes, it, it um, really helps me out now. But, so we can go in there, you can actually find out what's going on on your team. You can set up different alerts, so that's uh, code review alerts, there's uh, work item alerts, so hey, a bug was assigned to your team. Um, all, all the different ones, change sets, um, so uh, it commits, source control commits. There's all sorts of ones that you can come over here and manage. Um, you can heckle people. Oh, let's try that again. Let me head over here. Um, I'm going to heckle people. So um, I can do at mentions here. So like, hey, Brian, uh, your code sucks. <laughs> Check it out in bug number 33. So I'll do that. And then um, Brian will get a notification. Um, it'll ding uh, when he gets back into the room. Uh, but we have really rich links in here, too. So we actually know about things that are in the system. So bug 33 will actually take me over, um, allow me to open it and edit it and view it. Um, another thing is uh, you can't exactly see it here, but when Brian opens his screen, that'll actually turn orange. So that you can quickly scan and see um, where you have been mentioned um, in conversation. So that helps you out. Oh, crap. Gotta love conference internet. And it's, it's the only bad thing about having the, you know, demoing the Team Foundation service is you have to have internet connection. Yeah, what's up, Davo? Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Um, I, you know, I would, I would uh, probably have, what, I, what we found um, is that we end up with multiple monitors. Um, I've got like five monitors, six monitors on my screen. Um, by the way, mouse without borders is awesome. I've got three machines there and I'm like going back and forth between them all. Um, but anyway, I digress. One of my screens is the team room. Um, and so th it means I'm, I'm doing other activities during the day. I'll, I'll look at, you know, product planning stuff. You know, I'll look at um, stuff that's coming in, builds, and then I'll, I'll refer that, but I do hear you. And, and you may start to see, um, Adam made a very good point this morning, and I hope, I hope this group can appreciate it. We've actually moved to a more minimally viable product kind of approach. I don't know if you've read Eric Reese's book on Lean Startup, but really the idea around that is get something out there, you know, don't, don't bake it for, you know, two years. Um, and so we've done this in a few ways. You can kind of see this here. Um, every three weeks we'll just put in new features, new features. But what traditionally would have happened is we would have just saved all that up and gave it to a year or two later. Where, um, so we, we're a little bit light in certain areas, but the best part about that and the best part about Scrum in general is that we can hear, we can hear from our customers. Demo just told me we should probably consider a way of actually getting um, discoverable, a discoverable way of actually finding what bugs and you know work items and other kind of artifacts. So, user voice is a great way to do that. If you have my email address, you can send it to me too. Uh, but Adam only gets ten emails a year, so he has to use them wisely. <laughs> So then he just sends me these really long ones, and I don't know if you've ever read Adam's rules for uh, good email, but yeah, yeah, there's rules there, right? Uh, <laughs> so I see the ed comma <laughs> in bright, you know, what is that heading? It's, it's been a while since I've read Adam's rules, so. Um, well, good, yeah, so you'll see this. Um, we're, we're, I will say um, we are light in some areas. But I prefer that we get that out there. If you guys don't like that approach, let me know. 
Um, but it's a nice way of actually starting to use something, and then you guys can tell us what you think we should put in along the way. So, all right, cool. All right, so that's Team Room. I'll, I'm going to come back in just a second, but um, in the meantime, let me switch back over. And I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of some differences. So I hear this a lot. Hey, what's the difference between server and service? I might be making this decision right now, um, and I'll get, I'll get to something in a second. But here's, s here's some of those differences. So um, at a high level, I'll, I'll go down in a feature level a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Let's just go through the conversation. Um, version control. Version control um, on premises right now is actually not on par with the service. The service has get repos and stuff. So the the parity there will come come a little bit later, um, but y you know we'll you can see that there. Agile planning collaboration. There are pieces of that in both of them um, that are not at parity with one another. In build, build. Um, not everything that's available on premises is available in the cloud today, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. Uh, testing, certainly there's uh, some pieces that are available in the cloud that aren't available in on-premises. It's, it's in general, it's the laggard kind of thing. You know, there's differences there. Reporting, reporting is probably the biggest one. Um, we can't exactly host SQL analysis services cubes up in the cloud for everyone. <laughs> Just not in a reliable way, in something that would be cost efficient to you and us. Um, so we don't have that yet. Um, we have different uh, reporting experiences that are part of the product. So you'll see, you know, um, uh, Richard will probably talk about, you know, the sprint burndowns, the continuous, um, what is it called, the continuous flow diagrams. There's all sorts of in-product um, reports that you can get. Uh, you might see some other things from us, <laughs> which is what I'll say. Um, but you, you can't get the full-on um, reporting warehouse. So if, if you are using that, and it's actually a really strong um, piece of the product, uh, that would be something you want to keep on-premises for. Um, also, lab management. Lab management is our way of managing dev and test environments and spinning those up and doing all sorts of wonderful things with it. Um, but that's only available on premises right now. So there's a difference there. Um, another part about it, you can have unlimited team project collections. And in general, I would not recommend having more than one team project collection, but there are s a certain number of scenarios where that makes sense, um, especially at a company as large as Microsoft. And but in general, you only need one. Um, but other than that, you can have unlimited projects and teams inside of that. Um, in the service, you can only have one TPC. On premises, you can have unlimited TPCs. Right now, yep. So, um, just, just point to the integration. I'm just curious, like, um, yep. the project server and, and those ones, they just require a few fields in the workload for them to work. Yep. Uh, unless there's something they do. Uh, yeah, there's some back end, yeah, there's some back end things that run on the servers and stuff, so. Um, Um, it is all about, well, some, uh, there's actually a lot of things that go into it. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, are you specifically wondering how we would integrate Team Foundation Service with the on-premises edition of those or the hosted versions of those? Versions. Office 365? Yep. Yeah, because um, I'm not understanding uh, how much work is in the security side of things because obviously it's not something they do. But yeah. No, there are actually server-side extensions that are running on those. So in project server, there's actually project server bits that are running on each of the project server servers. SharePoint's the same way. There are SharePoint bits that are running on those. We can't exactly deploy all those to all tenants and all you know Office 365 tenants. Um, so we need to find a way of being able to do the same things a little bit differently. And we're working with the Office team about it. Now, um, prioritization is always the interesting one, right? You have to have uh, business value on those, and at the moment we've just been prioritizing some other things at the time, especially for the cost that I'll end up having on that. I learned that from you today, Adam. So, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're actually going through a product planning process right now um, for next year. Um, so it's it's been an interesting time for us. But we got to start charging you money first. So that's that's been a lot of the work we've been doing. So. <laughs> Um, so, so Adam mentioned there's a quite a few things um, that if you are, you know, using that for today, you can certainly use it, you know, Office 365 versions of those, and it's actually s what we do. We use Office 365 sh for SharePoint, um, and then we just don't have the integration back with TFS. So the integration is nice. We've just chosen that we would rather have Microsoft host. It's funny, right? We'd rather have Microsoft host SharePoint than we would... Uh, yeah, we're just not in that business, right? Um, we, developer division, is not in that business. <laughs> so another thing, um, multi-language support. Um, we only have English only right now. Data location, this might be something um, you're interested in. Right now, we only have a US data center. Um, so it's something you know we certainly need to think about. Uh, whereas your data is stored on premises um, on with the Team Foundation server. Uh, what else? Do you, yeah. Do you have any discussions with government departments? Yep. To implement yep. Areas? Not in Australia. So, so you know, there's other things that that we're missing. That's not necessarily where the data is stored. Um, you know, that our government and um, other highly regulated customers are. So, so I, I mentioned the ISO certification. That's one of those that, you know, if you need to get SOX or FDA compliance or you're PCI or any of those, you need an ISO certificate from the service provider. So we have certainly talked about some of those kinds of things. I think eventually we we might go down the route of having a government specific offering, um, but it's not it's not top of mind right now. So we probably want the AV integration first. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was going to mention. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, AD integration um, is also what you have on server. Right now, we only have uh, Microsoft accounts there. But yeah, there's there's a lot of. Hints about that one, have you? <laughs> Try and um, drop in hints that it might come in the future. I will tell you, it will come in the future. <laughs> 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 I don't have anything additional to share at this time, but uh, it will come in the future. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, under build, you've got a Team Foundation server that's not quite in, in parity with uh, Team Foundation server. What's yeah. the difference? Yeah, yeah, there's there's some things around Git um, that we're starting to integrate into. Um, the other interesting thing is I probably should have made it purple on both because, um, you know, uh, the Elastic build system that we'll talk about um, isn't available on premises either. So, I mean, we've got a little bit of mix match in both um, right now. But we, we actually aim for full parity on a lot of these things. So, The other big one, periodic updates. Um, you, if you pick on-premises, you have to upgrade your server, um, and you have to choose the cadence that you want to upgrade it on. I will say, um, now that we've moved to the point that I was going to make with um, the frequent delivery uh, discussion I had just a minute ago, is that we've actually driven the quality up of every single build we have. Um, so you can pick up any of those quarterly builds and, and start running those in production. I would even go as far as to say, if you wanted to take the TFS 2013 preview, I would say it's probably higher quality than the TFS 2012 RTM. I mean, we've gotten to that point where we have, um, e even our interim builds along the way are just a lot, really, really high quality. So, love it. Use it in production. We use it in production, so. Um, okay. Some other kind of details in here. Um, let's see, which one's coming up that are just... Um, the hosted load testing service. So we're going to have a talk specifically on that. Anthony Borton's going to do that. Um, but this is also another way of um, being able to have uh, essentially servers hosted for you that will do your load tests for you. So instead of having these... You know, load tests are interesting um, because you have to have a whole testing rig. You know, you, we've seen people, you know, with with tens of servers, um, hundreds of servers in their load testing rig um, that just sit around when they're not being used. So what we've done is we'll host them for you. You just tell us you know, how many virtual users you want. You uh, submit the uh, load test right from Visual Studio, and then we'll go and do that for you. 
um, and then you pay by the user in the minute. Um, you'll get a free amount included. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you want to learn about that, um, Anthony Borton will have that for you on tomorrow, I think. Yep, tomorrow. All right, what else is interesting on here? Oh, yeah, customized process templates. Right now, you cannot customize your process template on um, the Team Foundation service. There are some other ways of actually solving the same problems without actually having to customize any of the work items. So we've, we've introduced tagging. Um, what are some other things that we've done? Um, being able to customize your Kanban board instead of having to have a new state workflow, you can choose as many columns as you want. So um, you will see us go more and more that route instead of relying on process template customization. Um, but, and if anyone, anyone, is anyone interested in why we don't have process template customization? Yep, okay. All right, how many folks have ever upgraded TFS? All right, are your process, are your, um, are your team projects, are they, do they have any of the new features yet? They don't. <laughs> there is, and if you've ever been through that, um, XML transformation process, you will appreciate that not everyone wants to do that. <laughs> so uh, what's involved is traditionally like, so for example, when we introduced test case management, it, it actually wasn't that difficult. You just import the new test case work item and then you have to go in and modify a few other files and then get those done and you have to do that for every team project. Well, with the service, we actually do that for you. We do that for you. So every time we, we introduce something new, we will go in and upgrade all the process templates across the board for everybody. Well, the only way we can do that in a really reliable way is to have a known base to destination. So um, right now, uh, we've got it to where, you know, we, we just go, we go through th with that. So that's really the reason. There's a, there's a lot of complex work that goes behind that for us to eventually have something similar to that. But today, you can go in and, and do that um, on-premises. So if you really need that, you do have that option on-premises. All right. Um, s these slides, by the way, will be available up on Channel 9 after our talk today. So uh, feel free to review back um, to this one when you're ready. So for those folks um, that are interested in you know, why Team Foundation Service uh, we have a set of finished application lifecycle management services, so you don't have to worry about hosting or back <coughs> disaster recovery or any of those other kinds of things. Um, there's actually no infrastructure uh, overhead other than, so there's no infrastructure overhead. You just need to worry about how do you administer it for your teams, um, but all of these kinds of things are taken care of by us. Uh, we also monitor and um, take care of uh, privacy and security for your data. So it's very important to us. Um, and also, uh, you might want to go with the Team Foundation service if you want the latest, greatest, every three weeks, um, because that'll be the easiest way for you to do it, and you don't even have to worry about it. So here are some of the, the scenarios we've, def um, we've actually lined out um, right now. This is, as, as of today, if you are in one of these buckets, I would suggest you go with the Team Foundation Service. So, um, uh, team building, so independent applications. Um, if you have a distri geographically distributed team, you can use that. By the way, you can also use proxy servers in, in those individual offices if you want to kind of proxy uh, the source control content. That'll, that's a good way of doing that. We also proxy other things like work item attachments and some of those other stuff. But uh, the service will be the centralized um, server, and then you can have your proxy servers. But it's great for that. Um, we noticed a lot of teams actually have other people that are contributing to their projects as well. So if they're outside of your firewall or outside of your organization, this is a really good tool for that because um, you just you know ask for their Microsoft account <coughs> and they come right on in. Uh, if you're a team that's targeting Windows Azure um, from from a PaaS standpoint, um, you can actually take advantage of continuous delivery, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. And then also, if you're evaluating Team Foundation Server, I can't think of a better way of actually trying it out. Um, you can just create a new account and go with it. 
So let me show you a few other things in here. Let's see, did I get it right? Yes. Never know whether I get it right. Okay. So now that we're in here, I want to talk a little bit about um, the hosted build service. So if I come over here, let's see here. Actually, we'll just do any. All right, so you can see in here um, that we actually have a build, um, build service in here. And what's, what's interesting about the Team Foundation Service version of build is that we actually have a pool of build servers that we manage that template and we will uh, update it um, from time to time with the latest version of the SDKs and the tools and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we, we manage all that for you. But we have a pool of those build servers. And um, you can use our service. So really you just queue a build against what's called the, oh, that's what I meant right here. Uh, you can queue a build against what we call the hosted build controller. I don't, there should be another build controller there. Um, the build controller, the hosted build controller, whenever you see that, that just means ours. And then we will take care of it from there. And behind the scenes, what's interesting is we will provision new build servers every once in a while. And then we will assign one to you. And then it's a fresh, fresh image. And then once it's done, we will kill that machine. Um, and then you know, we'll, we'll put back another one in the queue. So it's kind of how it works. Um, it's just around for when you need it. And then we just keep going forward. We love the cloud for these kinds of things. Um, but you can also do um, one of these builds right here. I think, it's the, um, I think it is the accounting one. It actually is a Java build. So you can use these build servers for lots of different things. You know, you think about a build, a build is more than just compilation. A build is all of the different steps you want. You want unit tests to run, you want whatever. You can actually do that inside of um, the hosted build server. You can do Windows Store apps, Windows Phone apps. Um, we also have another build controller called Windows 8.1 build controller. Um, so if you are building Windows Store apps or want to build on top of Windows Server 2012 R2, You'll want to use that one. Right now, the hosted build controller is on Windows Server 2012, which is its equivalent as Windows 8. So um, we do have those two options for you. You can set them up to go do that. But the easiest way to do that is um, you can come in and connect to Team Foundation Service uh, right over here. And actually, one of the easiest ways to do that, if I go back to the home screen here, I love this. We're going to be using it for lots of other things. How many folks have ever noticed that? Open new instance of Visual Studio. It's great. It just sets it all up for you. It already connects you to that team. It, and it will ask you, hey, do you want to you know, set up a new workspace and all that kind of stuff? It's great. So, um, but the mechanism behind that, I mean, you know, it's just a URI that we now have a protocol and we know about on, on desktops. But uh, we're going to be using that for a lot of other stuff. So uh, if you uh, look at the test case stuff, you know, uh, there's a whole section for, for um, test case management that you can use in the service or on premises. Um, but we have a way of actually being able to open up the manual test runner or the test plan right from MTM. But we'll take you right to it. So, so a couple of quick ways of doing that there. But if we come over here, we can take a look at builds. And if we want to, we can create a new build definition. So you can see, here's some of my favorites. Um, I, can, I can come in here, add to other favorites there. I can see with those favorites kind of um, what happened over time. So you'll see pass, fail. There's also a partially succeeded um, if you want to use that in your, in your um, build process. Uh, you can take a look at any of these, come in and see um, all the details around these. So um, I can take a look here. I can see where that went. Um, I would see my work items that were associated, any bugs that were fixed, any um, tasks and features. Now we will actually roll it up to backlog items and then the features if you want us to. Um, we will roll that up into the build log report as well. Um, and then every build, 
And, and especially, this is, this is um, something, if you are a build engineer, that you could probably be interested in, um, is that we have, it, sometimes when the build fails, you need to get to the build server. Well, we don't give you the build server after it's done, it's kind of dead. So what we've done now is we will always do verbose um, diagnostic logging, and we will do that every single time, no matter whether you ask us um, or not. We we'll always store that, so you can always get to that um, at any time. So you can view logs, and you can see them over time, too, while it's running. It's kind of neat. The drop folder. The drop folder right now is actually stored in version control. So after the build is done, we will put all of the pieces that you just compiled together, and we'll store those in version control as well. Um, we may be moving um, a different direction with that, but essentially it'll be on the server for you. So this is our, our mechanism for that right now, which is great. Um, if you're actually on the, um, the, the web version of the UI, which Adam just loves, uh, you can also open the drop folder here. And what that will do is it'll bring that over, and then you can um, download the zip, a zip of that as well. So if, you're, if you don't have Visual Studio on your machine, you can certainly go and do that. That might be helpful for our you know, the Java developers or other folks who are using other kinds of um, uh, application development there. So if you want to get started with a new build definition, it's just right here, new build definition. And you can give it a name, um, our awesome ticket office. All right, there's a couple of things you need to go in in there. Um, you can do uh, either of the hosted um, build controllers. The other thing you can do is you can actually host your own build servers, whether in Azure or on-premises, and you can connect that up too. So if you have a special image or you need something additional on your build servers, you're more than welcome to go ahead and do that as well. And so you'll register that, and that will end up showing here as well. Um, so you pick which one you want. You tell us um, where you want that to go. Uh, you probably don't want to go with a file share on premises because our build server is not going to be able to get to it. Um, so you do that. Uh, then you go with the process. Really, the only thing that you really need to do is um, put your projects to build. So you just come in here and tell us what solutions. And so we can come in here and take a look at that, and I think if I go in here, yep, there we go. We're good to go there. So you can add as many as you want. Um, you can put them in the order that you want as well. Um, you actually don't need to do anything else. We, this would be a fully functioning build. Um, it, you can go in. You could do additional things like symbol server. Yep. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so the question um, is regarding the build process template. Uh, you can create your own builds um, workflows however you want to. There's a way of customizing those. They're Windows Workflow Foundation based. Um, so you get a nice WYSIWYG editor. You can have your own custom activities that you want to put in there. Um, that's the way we've actually done the Java builds. We just call the Java compiler. Um, you can do all sorts of things there. Um, uh, that make it really easy. So yeah, you can use your own custom ones. It's the same process. If you're interested, we have a really good walkthrough in our book. Oh, shameless plug for the buy in the book. Uh, just kidding there. Um, you can also run unit tests. So you can um, pick which tests you want to run, and you know we'll match it by DLL for you. Um, we will also run. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be MS test based test. We'll use X unit. We'll use N unit all of those as well. So lots of great things. Now one thing that is particular to the, um, the service is being able to do continuous delivery. Now I'm going to head back over here. And I'm going to oh, oh man, come on. <laughs> there we go. So interestingly enough, you get this tab right here called deployed. Deployed. Uh, one second, not today, let's just do any. 
This will show you all the builds that we've actually deployed to Azure. You can actually set up a link between Azure and Team Foundation Service. And if you do that, we will set up a special build definition for you. And then we will we do the handshake, we do all of that, and then every time you do a build of that one, whether that's by gated check-in, it's continuous integration, it's nightly, whatever you want to do, um, we will go in and actually push that over into Windows Azure for you. Um, and the way you get started with that is we come over here to manage Windows Azure.com. Let me hope. So this is great. So if you, even if you're not going to use Windows Azure for um, you know production use, you can set this up even for dev tests. I, I think you um, you saw us mention a couple of things yesterday. Um, you can create a, a Azure website really really quickly, um, and then use that just for testing. And then you can set up this continuous delivery build that goes right to it. So you don't need a domain name for it at all. You can just use the the default one that we do. But um, I'm going to do a different one because obviously that would not be good. <laughs> All right, we'll quick, quick create that one. Um, I'm going to move it over to the west and uh, ticket Oz. Yes, yes. And that will be the URL itself. So you'll, you'll go in and see um, it'll be ticket Oz TF service dot Azure websites dot net. And so that would be immediately available. It's ready to go. Um, all I have to do now is I hook it up here. So um, let me come to the dashboard here. And then you will see right here, set up deployment from source control. All right. So we go there. And then the first option you have is Team Foundation Service. So when we do that, we will go in and ask you, say, hey, Martin Wu, this is the, the account I'm using right now. It's Martin Woodwards. Um, we will go over the Team Foundation service. We'll give you an OAuth um, response, and it'll ask you, hey, do you want to give um, Azure permission, this permission to your Team Foundation service account? So give it a second here. There we go. Um, we'll tell it which team project we're in. And then it starts to link that up. Give that a second. All right, that's good. It's now linked. You get a new tab right up here called Deployments. So now all of the deployments that I do, I not only see it in Team Foundation Service, but I also see it in Azure. And the really cool part about that is if you want to roll back, we can roll back for you because we know about the earlier deployments. You can just pick roll back anytime you want to. But we can also see the history um, in either place. So whoever is managing it is good to go. The other thing we have is if I refresh this, you'll now see ticket all service um, TF service dash CD for continu continuous delivery. So you just go in. We created that for you. Um, the only thing we really need to do um, is actually, hey, what um, what what solution has that website in it? So. You just go in, tell us what solution to build. We have all of the other pieces already in there, so the Azure management certificates, we have taken care of all that. You're ready to go. So um, if you're doing any kind of Azure development, I picked a website here, but if you're using mobile services, if you're using any cloud-based cloud services, so web, web and work, worker roles, we actually handle all of that. Um, and so you'll have a different experience inside of Windows Azure, but it's very similar. So you can do any of that. You can set that up right away. Yes? Uh, what about security control in the case that you have more traders who are switching outputs from Windows? Uh, what, what would be a typical way of uh, structuring security control? So that would be a great segue into my talk later today on release management. So release management is really about the ability to take multiple components and you know track them as a release and then deploy them as a release. So we'd be able to do that there. This one. Um, is really designed for those self-contained kind of services. Um, interestingly, the Team Foundation service can be deployed like this too. It's funny enough, but um, we can do that. But it, it's it's contained in a way. So if you have yours contained in a way that it can be done in a single build, then you can use this approach. Now you can always create a definition, a continuous delivery definition that's manual, or maybe 
you know, less frequent than continuous, um, and have other builds that do the individual pieces. And then this one just does the all up one. So you can go several routes with that. Yes? Um, I'll give you an example where I work. We, we do a Windows Forms application, and one setup we have in the build cycle that we can't allow to use it is to only install the tools we generate and install. Yep. So, say if I was to set up a single admin service build for that particular build, yep. would I be able to, to install without the install shield? Um, no, um, because install shield wouldn't be installed on the build server itself. That would be a case I would say, you know, you might want to go with your custom build server route. Now you can always put in Azure. Um, and then once you put in Azure, you can set up. Um, I actually have a, in my account, I don't know if you saw it. I have a dev test bridge to on-premises. Um, it's called a virtual network. Basically, it's a site-to-site -site or a point-to-site VPN. So everything in that little cloud area um, can have access back to on-premises and vice versa. So um, you can always set that up. That's just a feature inside of there. But we can't, you can't set up one of those and then say that our build servers can do that. It it's gets a little weird there. And then our machines are not joined to your domain. They aren't joined to our domain. It's weird. It's a good question. Um, we have a whole list of what's installed on the build server that we keep up to date. Um, actually, Tarun has a really, I have to remember that. Um, which site, uh, which site is that? Well, let's go to the learn. Um, tfsavagalstudio.com. Short answer to your question is that um, we have Java compiler already there. But you could always have a specific, um, you know, a pre, pre-compile step where you use PowerShell or something, you can copy something from version control. You know, because you tell us what to download to version control on the machine, then you can do anything you want to, you know, run PowerShell scripts, run, you know, executables. Uh, just don't do anything crazy. So, uh, no. We, we take care of that, too. Um, but, yeah, I would, I would go that route. There, there is a base set of, of um, tools that we have. So, if I go here... Build, hosted build controller. Uh, down here at the bottom, there we go. Um, this is actually not up to date, but uh, I have already sent them a, 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 th a uh, email about that. But if you see four more details, see this list. Um, Tarun has actually, um, he has a build that runs every night on the build server in the hosted build cloud. And all it does is it ca captures what's installed on it and it goes and updates the site. So you can see exactly which versions. This is always, it's really sad when this is the one that's up to date. Um, but he has everything that's actually installed on this one. Uh, so it's, we've got lots and lots of stuff. Azure SDK, phone SDK, we've got multiple versions of those SDKs on there if you need them. We pretty much got a lot. Um, we can't put everything in the world. We're trying to solve the 80% case. Um, uh, and certainly, we can't put anything on there that we don't have a license to actually install on there as well. Um, so that's always a trick, too. But um, if it's free, the other, oh, the other way of doing this is um, if you aren't a user of NuGet, totally use NuGet. NuGet, you can just register those NuGet packages with your solution and projects. Um, and the build service will go in and grab, you know, the versions, the versions of the NuGet packages you need um, automatically for you as well. So you can totally do that too. So there, there's a couple of options there. All right, cool. Any other questions about kind of the continuous delivery flow? Let's see, what time do we have? I don't want to keep you from lunch, so we have about 15 minutes. Yep. Git and TFS. So you, you showed um, adding, sorry, connecting TFS as your yep. um, VPN to <coughs> GitHub and things like that. Yeah. Is it allowed to have your Git um, from TFS down there? Is it not? No. Uh, maybe I'm confusing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. continuous delivery. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? That'd be a great conversation if you have a red shirt and you're going to a, a lunch. Is that tomorrow? Be a great conversation for Mr. Goo there. <laughs> Although we're actually talking. Um, yeah, but we want. It is doable. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's a great question. All right, cool. Let me switch back over then and go through the last couple of things, and we'll take questions at the end. Um, all right. So right now, uh, we're in a preview. We will not charge you anything. You can use as many users. You can use as much build as you want. You can use um, a certain amount of load testing. Uh, we don't. There's. Don't put your ISO images and please don't do that. <laughs> but uh, we, there's no cost to it right now. So there's absolutely no cost um, for those of folks that are in either of these buckets. Um, you will not have to worry about. Uh, so if there will always be a free plan for up to five users, and that includes r private repos as well. So if your team is five or less, you're good to go. Um, uh, eligible MSDN subscribers in those buckets, you will have Team Foundation service included as a benefit for, for you in as part of your subscription. So there's no worries about that there. I realize that there are a lot of people that might be outside of these two camps. So um, we don't have additional information to share just yet, but we will. <laughs> and that is what I can usually say about that. So if you're really concerned about it, come talk to me. Um, you can give me some hypotheticals, and I might tell you, you might be good. <laughs> so just come, come talk to me. Um, I don't want anyone to ever feel like they can't make a decision to use the service based on just pricing alone. So, uh, all right, the other way, um, the other thing I wanted to, to show you is that, you know, it's really hard to keep up with what is um, updated every week, um, every three weeks with our service. So, we've done a few things. We've actually put um, a, re a release notes together. So, I'll come back over here. Where is it? Ah, we'll just go here again. Um, we'll go over to news. And then w every, every um, three weeks, we actually put a new blog post in here, and you can certainly subscribe to it. Um, but one of the really nice things is we've kind of summarized it. We'll keep this up to date. It's called the Release Archive. Release Archive is great because we will summarize each of the three-week sprints. Um, some weeks you'll see more new value than others, obviously. Um, but we will also tell you which server version um, that new feature will be in. So if you want to look at this for on-premises, you'll see that. You can go and download the quarterly update if you want to as well. You can see a lot of stuff is waiting for 2013 right now. But, but um, you can certainly use this as a way of keeping, it tr keeping track of what we've done, and it's a really great way of, of doing that. I'm so glad we did that. So I'm tired of answering questions, like, when is this and that? I'm going to say, hey, look at the release archive. Um, there's an RSS news feed on that site as well, so you can do that and put it in your favorite um, RSS subscription. Um, we also have uh, Brian Harris' blog. You know, you can certainly do that. He will always be the first one to tell you except when I did it 12 hours earlier yesterday in the keynote <laughs> for the thing that was announced earlier today. Um, um, and then also, you can certainly ask your local account team, you know, Steve Foster and all those folks. Um, they can certainly keep you up to date, and you can have conversations with them about, you know, what's needed. So do you have any questions? We've got five minutes. I just want to open the floor for any questions. So you first. Yeah, um, it's not it's not great right now. Um, you know, uh, we have a couple of partner tools that will help you even play back some of that history, including even test cases and stuff. So Ops Hub is a really good one. Um, Timely migration is another one if you're just worried about version control. Um, but it's right now it's it's certainly been one of those. Hey, you know, 
it's kind of a cut and run almost approach, um, and we realize that some teams are actually moving smaller parts of their organization at a time, you know, and thinking about those kinds of things. So uh, we understand. We want to make that a nice experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> Keep going the way you're going right now. It, it would be my suggestion, um, and we'll we'll have something for you. Mr. Kogan. Adam. No, no, no. There's, there's complexity in every part of the product. We have, you think about um, the way we ad uh, address path spaces inside of version control. It's with the team project name. I mean, we think about all the different places, uh, work item tracking. Um, there's lots of places where we actually have, it, it's going to be a complex one. But we know about it. <laughs> and we know where it is. It's always that, you know, business value, um, estimate, uh, cost estimate, ROI, right? And, and good database design. And good database design. Yeah, sometimes. So we've actually, uh, this is a legacy one. I hate this one. You, you, you know, all of the guys on the team hate this one. So uh, we, want, we want to do it. Yep, what's um, up? If, so if we've got a client who's looking to move towards CFS for, for some kind of a service, but I'm a little bit scared because it's free and I don't know how much the team can get with that. You can have them talk to me. Is it, is it true to say that until you can get your code out of it, so we made a promise a while back that if you will use the service, we will give you time as soon as we've announced some pricing or billing or whatever. We will give you plenty of time um, where you will not be charged, um, and we will have a way for you to get out of the service. So we do not want you to – we we think our plans are going to be very competitive with what the market has available for ALM cloud hosting, but certainly we will give you options um, if you choose to go back on premises. So, so one way that can be an alternative is more of a free app version? Um, the, the pricing details we've announced <laughs> is that we will always have a free plan for five users. Um, so if your team is less than five, you do not have to worry about any um, user charges. So we will, um, that is very important to us. So um, we will not turn on billing and we will not surprise anyone about it. So. Yeah, you, you're good. Yeah. Uh, if you have MSDN, that's the best way to get Team Foundation service. It's the best. I can't answer that yet. So. Um, I will I will I will refer you to the current SKU model and um, maybe different capabilities that are available to different uh, MSDN levels in the on-premises product. So, <laughs> uh, I I could expect that we continue to go that route. Um, any other questions? You know, feel free to catch me in the dev den. Yeah. Um, for the service or the server? Because I can't really answer that today um, with the service. It's yeah. completely free right now. Okay. So um, if you were to do this on the server, then yes, they would need a cow. Uh, we did, by the way, move agile planning down into the cow instead of having to have premium, ultimate, or test professional. So agile planning is just part of the cow now. That in 2013 and forward, not 2012. No, it's, it's more about the product backlog planning, the sprint planning, the capacity planning, uh, the Kanban boards. Um, those, are, those are all what we consider agile planning. So today in 2012, you have to have a license for premium, ultimate, or test professional, which, you know, you think about product, product owners. We would, we would like them to use test professional. Test professional is actually meant for lots of other things other than testing. You think about exploratory testing looking and reviewing test plans. Those are all things that product owners do. You know, they also need dev and test environments um, to actually explore with. Uh, we, we've designed test professional to be really that, that type of skew for that, and that there's a price point for that that we've done as well for them. All right, any other questions? 
happy to help out. Come, come to my session a little bit later. We'll actually talk about release management uh, with Team Foundation Server. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to get in touch with me later. Um, and, and we'll be happy to help you out. All right, thanks. <laughs>